And so, you know, God and the saints, they're all with us. You know, we just, the problem is, is we aren't tuned in, you know? And once we get tuned in, and that's where like rhythm and, and consistency comes into play. Once we get tuned in, it's like, yeah, duh, of course God's going to talk to us every day if we want to listen. We don't want to hear what he has to say all the time, but you know, it's, he's talking to us. to the royal path uh i'm your host andrew and uh we took a week off last week because i think we we're talking about about maybe after every feast taking the next week off we're not sure um just as a way of kind of celebrating um i don't know if that's going to stick around but also i got really really sick so that was the real reason we didn't record last week so um i'm How sorry are you feeling you look i'm much better now yeah, much better good. Um, you know, man, it was, it was pretty hit and miss there for a little while. Um, mm. but, uh, my whole family got it except for my daughter and whatever it was just as like, just like kind of just couldn't breathe, couldn't mm -hmm. like, uh, just like kind of achy, no real big fever, just like, just like enough to just kind of be a pain in the butt, just kind of like be there, like right in front of your face, you know, at all times to kind of be like, Hey, I'm still here. I'm still making your life just a little bit more difficult. But, um, wait, yeah. did you see oh. Spider-Man in the theaters? Oh yeah. That's the big joke. That's the big joke. Did you get, did, did you get sick like a few days after seeing Spider-Man? Uh, no, but okay. I could, that's the, that's the big, uh, that's the big joke right now. I could Even see SNL it. did it. Yeah. Saturday Night Live just had a thing on it too, where they were oh like, ah, "Don't stop seeing Sp Spider Man," because everybody gets sick after seeing Spider Man. Oh, I did see <laughs> Spider Man, but my son didn't, and my son was the one that brought it to us. Okay, so fair enough. My little little Nikolai, with his little pure innocent heart, got sick. Mm -hmm. I think actually on like Thursday, and by Saturday we all had it. So yep. yeah, it was a little Nikolai. Yep. So God love him. Um, the joy, the joy of children. <laughs> yeah for real i mean i'm not complaining my immune yeah. system is stronger now so i mean yeah, i'm exactly. not worried about it so as is as is his as is his exactly i got yeah. sick you get sick it just happens sometimes it's wait not... a minute wait people get sick you mean wait there's sickness <laughs> has that has that wait that i don't remember that ever being the case i don't remember anybody ever getting sick for a few days we I never, never got that sick. had never happened no never never, never nobody had ever like this nobody this ever got one sick. thing this is all one thing. I used to wear a mask all the time. I, wore, I grew up wearing a mask, and we never got sick like this before. So. I was on I, I was on the swim team, and we used to have to wear a mask <laughs> on the swim team. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I kind of. I just want to say this one thing. Forgive me, please. I, I'm oh. the feeling that the you know when SNL goes stale. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yep. I used to yep. I used to watch Saturday Night Live religiously when I was a kid, you know, like, and then it's like, I don't know. I'm I'm just saying. I felt like around the time I was like, I'm not into this anymore. They would change the crew. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, how many sick jokes can the world tell now? How, like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? We've got we've got to find something else because it's just like, you know. Well, they've, changed, the, they've changed out some of their crew they're, they're changing, they're changing out. out the crew a little bit yeah yeah they're changing yeah. out they're the crew a little stop bit making jokes about being sick father what's that are you saying we need to stop making jokes about being sick well i'm just saying the whole world is an snl skin yeah. yeah basically and and the crew it's just like you know that that kind of theme and running gag of like, the like sickness. a modern retelling of that shakespeare quote like it said, the world is a stage. The whole world is an SNL skit. The whole world is an SNL Well, skit. that was the funny thing about that, or the ironic thing about that is that was the cold open for this week. I don't watch SNL, but somebody was like, oh, no, you got to see this cold open. And it's basically one of the new cast members playing Joe Biden. 
and he is and basically what it comes down to is that uh this whole that it's a multiverse and that this particular universe is a complete was made as a joke the one that we're in oh my gosh so it it actually is that that's they actually say like and he's going into all how ridiculous everything has been and so the person that i saw this from was like oh i think it's rap guys like i think we're moving on to the next thing whatever the next thing is because uh even snl now is like yo all he's there's one point where he goes what do you mean you gotta walk you walk into a restaurant wearing a mask and then you sit down and you take it off the whole time you're eating but then if you want to go to the bathroom you got to put the mask back on what is there COVID in the bathroom and it's (laughs) and it's snl as joe biden doing that right see that's like a flip it's it's wild too because i'm like the narrative like the mouthpieces are now picking up the the deconstruction of the narrative right so Mm -hmm. you know the the and that has to be allowed, right, Father? For for the next the next act, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that like has yeah yeah allowed I mean, like yeah yeah. You know, my my spidey sense is tingling because like Saturday Night Live has been coming up a lot recently, hmm. um, and like I don't necessarily know what this is. I have no idea. I just pick up on it every once in a while. But like, because there's the pizza thing, the uh, almost pizza. Or whatever it was, Cyprian. Oh, Pizza Gate. What's that? No, not Pizza Gate. You're talking about like what is what is this? No, no, no. The it was almost pizza where he's like, "Is it food?" He's like, "Come on, just try it." And he's like, "I'm not eating." Oh, it. yeah. Was that SNL? That's SNL. And no. Then, yeah, it's Bill Hader with the with the mom. With the mom's yeah. like really That's an SNL skit. Yeah. That I, have you seen that Cyprian? Oh man, no. it's good. Yeah, it's real it good. Is. I gotta watch it. Watch oh it. man, it's... almost pizza and Bill Hader's like, "What is this?" And she's like, "It's it's pizza." And he's and she's like, "It's almost pizza." Oh, so it's like tofu pizza. She's like, "You can still put tofu on pizza and legally call it pizza," but she's like, oh, "No, no, no, this is almost pizza." He's like, "Well, is it food?" She's like, "Come on, try a piece." <laughs> and then he's like. I'm not going to eat this. It keeps getting hotter. Why is it getting hotter? Yeah, I, he's like, why is it getting oh. hotter? Yeah. And then she's like, he's like, it smells like pizza. And she's like, that was their intention. He's like, who? Whose intention was it? And she's like, just try some. It's not. A-. And then like at the end, he smacks it out of her, his daughter's hand. His daughter goes to get a piece. She's like, oh, pizza. And, yeah. And then and it he's just like, no. breaks. Oh, it he breaks? smacks it out of her hand. It hits like, the ground. It shatters in the glass. Yeah, that's awesome. And then there's awesome. the the headache test that we talked yep. about last time that we did yep. it. So. That's on the last the last video video or before episode last episode or episode before. That's in sure. the description if people want to go check it out. That one's just like prescient. Yeah, very prescient. It's it's interesting. It's very interesting. That's well, we I'm have saying. we have um. Did we are we going to do the question and answer? I thought this so. Is, I thought this is a good one. I did little to no preparation on the okay. next part of the creed. Um, and there's material I could research and I just didn't do it. So I figured that maybe we should just do question and answer if that's okay. Well, we have we have some really great questions. No, 100%. I read through them beforehand. I think that they're all really good. Um, so let's start there. I think start at the top. Do you have them? I, I have them. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, would it be okay? I actually just because LR is a person that I know, I'm familiar okay. with LR. So I was gonna do LR first. Okay. Um okay, so LR father. Uh, in your up- upcoming QA, please elaborate on the orthodox view of the concept of assurance and salvation. For instance. As a believer who prays daily and seeks to surrender my will to God's, can I say with assurance that I'm currently a child of God? Um, So I happen to know this person. And uh, we had talked about a couple episodes ago um, that uh, we had talked about how I had brought up that like there was somebody who said it was like a Protestant lady who said, um, well, I don't know if I believe that Orthodox are saved. And, 
you and I, Father, kind of joked around and said, well, yeah, we don't know if we're saved either. Like, we don't know. And that person, it kind of disturbed their soul a little bit because we're sitting there talking like, sure, we're Christians. Sure, you know, we do the things that we're supposed to do to the extent that we can do them. We fall, we repent, blah, blah, blah. But like, there is no assurance of salvation. I don't know if I'm going to, if I'm going to heaven at the end of everything. So I think that this particular person was looking in context of, I'm really sorry, Romans 10, Romans 10, where St. Paul is talking about like, for I'm uh, confessing faith, so therefore I'm saved. Like, it's like, in order to be saved, you just need to confess faith. I think it's like Romans 10, 8. I'm, I'm sure I'm getting that wrong. But through that context, St. Paul says something to the effect of, I'm confessing faith, so therefore I am saved, or something like that. I can look up the scripture while you guys vamp for a second. Sure. Um, well, there's so many ways to tackle it. I, I think one of the things that is important to understand is um, kind of deconstructing where that um, idea and need for assurance and salvation, this context comes from. Um, I think that, you know, the one of the best ways to understand this is to understand what what is salvation and not looking at salvation um, as a, a kind of destination um, or also looking at salvation necessarily as um, something that's earned, but rather understanding salvation as relation and father i'm so sorry i can't really hear you could you speak up a little bit sorry am i low yeah i think you're just a little bit low okay um so understanding salvation as, as in in return in terms of relation relationship right and, and i'm 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 gonna kind of work with a pun here right so relationship to god right but also in relation to, you know, the intention of our of our being, how we were made, how, what what was God's intended purpose for for man to be created. When you understand that, then it begins. Then you can begin to understand salvation. So, in order to be saved, you you can't salvage something that is inherently, you know, bad or broken or evil, right? To salvage something means to keep something that keep something that it has value from not simply further corruption, but to restore it to its former glory, its former purpose. Right? That's you save something. It's like um, I don't know if I need to go ad nauseum to it, but you know, it's like if you're making an apple pie, right, and you've added too much sugar or something, like how are we going to save this pie, right? Well, if you say that, that means like, oh, we can still try to do something, but we need to do something, right? So we're going to add other ingredients so the sugar isn't overwhelming. You, you get the point, right? But you, know, you, don't, you don't say, you don't look at a pile of excrement and go, how am I going to save this? You flush the excrement down the toilet. No one ever says, what am I going to do with this excrement? Like no one ever thinks that. Well, you get what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah. Someone makes a mud thatch roof out of it, but <laughs> <laughs> point, you, you get my point. Sure. So anyways, so when you understand that, then we can kind of go down this road a little bit because this experience seems to me the, the new theologian, he, he talks about how um, believers must have some examples, some experiences of salvation, the, the connection with God, um, the deification, the life of God in this life. Like you, you have to have it. If you don't, some flash, some glimpse of it, then you should be worried. So in that context, this is, this is the closest I think we would like to go to talking about assurance of salvation. When someone like Saint Simeon, the new theologian talks about, well, if you are in God, in Christ, you will have these experiences which will show to you that you now here's the thing being in christ is a present tense thing 
So we will say, you know, God has saved me, right? God is saving me now, right? And by his grace, I'll be saved, right? The problem that um, LR and others might have is the, the future portion of it. And the reason simply put why we can't do that is because number one, we're not God. And although God is faithful, even when we are not faithful, and although all those who call the name of the Lord shall be saved, we have to understand what that means. Because what about the scripture that says, you know, in that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not work miracles in your name? And I will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you, right? Um, there's, there are those who walked with Jesus and then walked with him no more, including Judas and including se several, uh, uh, several of the disciples who left him at around John 6. You know, in John 6, 6, 6, it talks about, interesting call, call number, it talks about those who no longer walk with Jesus anymore because he gave the word about the Eucharist, about it being his body and his blood. And they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And he didn't, re he didn't rebuke them. He didn't excuse it. He didn't explain it. He didn't say, well, it's a metaphor for this that he left it alone. And many couldn't receive it and they walked with him no more. So there are people we know, including Judas, right? Judas saw all the miracles that every other apostle saw. I think I've mentioned this before, but um, it's in the, I want to say it's on, and forgive me, bad priest. I want to say it's on, on Holy Friday. Um, yes. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah but, but there's, the, there's the hymnography about Judas, and he's just like, hey, what miracle did I show the apostles that I did, the others I didn't show you, right? Jesus held nothing back from Judas, knowing fully well who he was the whole time, right? He was lost. So I, I, I think the question is really understood better in the context of where the motivation coming from, right? Um, a man and a woman in a healthy relationship, a healthy marriage, right? There is this understanding, you know, ride or die, to death do us part, right? But that understanding of to death to do us part, well, we know what happens if the husband takes that for granted, right? We, we, we know that story all too well. We know what happens if the wife takes that for granted. We know that story all too well, right? Well, it's the same thing with God. You know, people can say, hey, I'm saved. And people do this. I'm saved. And I'm not even talking about them lapsing into, quote, unquote, you know, the, the um, I used to hear this term a lot, quote, unquote, cheap grace, which is just all bad theology, bad statement. But, you know, don't, don't just kind of ride on being, quote, unquote, saved. But see, the problem with that is, is I'm not even talking about people who say, like, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And, and they do. They live like hell. I'm talking about people who are missing out on the illuminating aspects of the life in Christ. If you move away from this idea of saved or not saved, and just get into this understanding of depth and, and growing in your knowledge of Christ and experiencing the grace, the energy, the, the, the life-giving energies of Christ. Um, if, we, if you just focus on that, then what you'll find is this idea, this question of, am I saved or not? takes on a different tone. It's not that you won't ever ask it. It's just that you'll understand how great and holy God is and how fickle we are, right? And that, that humility is necessary. It's, it's a necessary requirement because we've all, anyone who's been honest about it, we experience it. And we see it first and foremost in the saints. The saints have this humility and reproach to their salvation. So therefore, since they have that humility, right, we should seek to emulate it and to understand why that have, why they had that type of humility. Now, I'll say this one thing too, because it's it's always both and not either or. The saints also had a confidence in their in Christ's mercy. So, I think that it can be a misnomer to to hear us talking about certain things and run with it too much to the left or to the right. Because I have, I have an incredible amount of confidence in, in, in 
the Lord's mercy and his grace. And when I mean by grace, I mean his ability to work in my life and to save me. Right. Um, you know, I, I <laughs> not to scare, I mean, I have Romans 8, 38 and 39 tattooed on my throat. Right. For I'm convinced I'm neither life nor death, nor, nor past or future hell, uh, demon or angel, nor, nor anything created shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Like I'm, I'm convinced of it. Right. But that conviction is not predicated on, on God being bound by some oath I made. Right. It, it's, it's, it's contingent upon his mercy, his love, which has been laid out for all, but, but my willingness to accept it and to receive it. Right. So in summary, it's kind of a little bit like it would be a requirement to almost be like, well, I'm not, it's like a required state of being a little bit to be like, well, I'm not sure I am saved because I am fickle because I am fallen. But at the same time, I have incredible confidence in God's mercy. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm bad. God is good. I'm trying, you know, that type of right. thing. Yeah. So it shouldn't really be disturbing. It's more just like, I think, I think maybe it's a little bit of a response to um, this idea of like, you say those seven magic words or whatever they are. I confess Christ Jesus, right. my Lord and savior, and you're good. Like, I think like that's a response right. to that. It's like this, this Western notion. So I'm being well, like, there's also, I mean, it brings the, the, the sense and the feeling that I get, this sort of takes me back to my first, when I was probably seven or eight years old and first encountering like evangelicals, like non-denominational evangelicals, kids in my school, whatever. And this now again, have you been, I was baptized Catholic. I was brought up like in the Episcopal church encountering like real Protestants, like American Protestants for the first time sort of in the wild in my life, the, the emphasis, this emphasis on all of this matters, like everything that we're doing, the reason why it matters is because after we die, like after we die, we're going to be judged. You, you need to be concerned exclusively with this and everything is leading up to that, right? Like that, that it wasn't this idea of, as you say, like salvation in the present tense, that the idea was no it's going to be a horrible, horrible experience. There's going to be nothing redemptive about it. Life, I mean. Life is going to be a terrible experience. There's going to be nothing redemptive about it. Um, but, you know, if you, if you are within our church, then you will be able to go to heaven when you die. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and I seem, it seems like there's some of that, like, in Catholicism too, but the it seems to me that that emphasis is not as strong in orthodoxy and that orthodoxy is much stronger, has a much stronger bent toward the now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the biggest things is that there's such an emphasis on prayer. And I know this, this may sound almost ridiculously simple but if you really if you think about it you know the, the orthodox church okay just from my perspective coming in a, a, coming in as a convert i was like wow orthodoxy is is there's such an emphasis on prayer you know it's like the sacraments absolutely but i from my perspective the sacraments really be, begin to be emphasize to you once you've kind of like come in you know but prior to that it's all about prayer it's all about prayer it's all about prayer and, and where i'm getting at with this is <clears throat> prayer is something that you can only experience in the now <laughs> you know what i mean if like if you really kind of break it down prayer isn't something that you um isn't something that you experience in any other way, except prayer is a practice of the presence, right? Pun intended, right? Like the present and the presence of God, like the presence of God is the present. When you begin to understand the presence of God is the present, then it's like, okay, you know, 
that understanding is, I think, one of the things that can help someone add a little bit of seasoning and a little bit of, you know, uh, a little bit of ajou to their prayer if it's feeling dry. Because when you begin to understand that what you're doing right then and there matters because right then and there is the presence of God because God is in the present. Then what you start realizing is um, we can go in different aspects and talk about putting money in the bank. And that, that's fine. I hear all that. But the bigger thing is being present now in the presence of God. And there's such a strong emphasis on that in orthodoxy. You have to understand, you have to begin to start thinking, well, what is it about the state of being? What is it about salvation that the church has maintained in, in this context? What is it? What is it about the state of salvation not just being a kind of eschatological event is what I'm getting at, right? Um, and I think, I think there's a thing where because we're in America and, and there's, a, there's like a kind of overcorrection to all the unsober, false, you know, left behind and all that stuff in regards of end times theology. I think that there's kind of been an overcorrection for a lot of Orthodox, a lot of Catholics in regards of dealing with eschatology and, and things in the end times, you know, and things in, in, the, in the future kingdom, the Perusia. But it's very much in our tradition. And the reason for that is because, right, that experience, it's the fulfillment of the now. Like the saints are in that perpetual now all the time. You know, when St. John Maximovich appears to someone, right? When St. Paisius appears to someone, like they're, they're, that appearance is, it's, they're, they are in, the future age. I mean, they're they're in the kingdom, right? But they're coming to us now, and so that whole—I mean, forget multiverses, right? Like that's all, you know, that's all. That's a bunch of shenanigans, right? That that's the real deal, right there. And and it's it's really moving in and through and out of our understanding of time, right? You move in it, through it, and then out of it, and that's really key. And it's key because when you do prayer when you pray excuse me it sounds weird when you do when you pray then you are beginning to get that little taste of eternity and that, that that's something that i hope everyone can have in, in the back of their heads when they just they want to yawn and say that i don't really want to do my evening prayers it's like no man do your prayers like get that little get that little scoop of eternity and, and saint macarius St. Macarius the Great says, the crown of every pious life and the height of all good deeds is the constant work of prayer. Mm -hmm. So, And I would just I would just put this cap on that. I love St. Macarius, but I put this cap on it in, in this regard. If you want to understand salvation, you can't understand salvation without prayer. That I think that's one of the things, too, in regards of... Um, you know, workers of iniquity, I never knew you. It's like those who are practicing prayer, like if you're truly practicing prayer, that's where you'll find your assurance of salvation that you're looking for. Because it's it's in that continually running to the presence of God that that confidence is found. But it is not found in doctrinal understandings. It's not even found in dogmas, right? Dogmas are there, but you have to have the experience in order for the dogma to be actualized in your life. This is this is bringing up to me uh, a real better understanding of this notion of a personal relationship, like mm -hmm. yet another thing that the evangelicals like like to personal relationship. And yet I never saw it like I never saw like I'd hear this. Oh, you know except Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and these types of things, these ideas. But in prayer, this idea of the personal relationship that, that like you say, I couldn't get from just sitting down and reading scripture because yes, that's wonderful. There's, there would be the principles would be there, but I couldn't see, you know, my, 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 my desires, my, 
uh, longings, my hurt, whatever it is that I take that into prayer. And then the answer, mm -hmm. you know, in my life, at, mm -hmm. you know, as my life continues on, that it's like, oh, thank you, that it's that it's answered. And, and I feel like, yeah, because I, I have approached spirituality intellectually in a lot of ways, but it's such a difference to have, to see, oh, this is answered. And even the things that I didn't even, I, I don't know, it's not like I'm asking to do a specific thing, but I'm just like, here I am, you know? And then like, ah, I see you. Like, you know, th this feeling of, oh, I'm being seen. Oh, it's being, something is happening in my life, you know? It's, and it's, it's very difficult to explain, but it does, it changes it from this abstract notion to this very personal, mm -hmm. subjective, like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, oh, wow, like I'm being seen, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not where you're going with it, but I just want to say this one little portion, and that is, you know, this idea about personal relationship with God, it's actually in our tradition, too. It's not phrased in that way, right? It's, it's very much in our tradition. You'll find it, um, especially you'll find it with some contemporary elders who will talk about it. They won't, they won't use it in that context. St. Simon the Theologian, I bring him up again. He's another one that talks about this, having this real experience and, and knowing God in a sense. The, the trick and the problem though, is that for many of these people, for all of them really, they have a anemic at best, anemic. Um, encounter with God, right? I had an anemic encounter with God, right? I did not have the fullness of God, right? I had some inkling of something, yes. If I didn't, I would have never, you know, it's Christ who brought me to the church, right? And I acknowledge that. And I acknowledge all the areas I, where I was apprehending him falsely, you know? And, you know, you, we repent of it. And we, we bow our knee to the true God, right? Uh, and his, his kingship, his lordship, and his church, right? That's the issue, is that the, the, the God you're having a relationship with is, is it's not him in his fullness. And there's so, a lot of projection. There's a lot of things that are there that need to be purified. Right? May I ask? really then really quick because we speak a lot in our tradition and everything of boldness before god mm -hmm. what would you say is the difference between boldness before god in an orthodox sense and boldness and before god what we were kind of talking about the other week of like oh me and the big guy upstairs you know yeah, reverence the big difference is the big difference is reverence um the big difference is humility um boldness before god in a context for us as orthodox is never familiarity it's never a casualness, right? Familiarity breeds contempt. It's never that. It's never the buddy Christ, right? It's the judge. It's, it's, it's the, the widow who goes before the wicked judge and begs him justice. And the wicked judge says, okay, I'm tired of you bothering me. I'll give you justice, right? That's a wicked judge. How much more so the good God, the good judge, right? So that, that widow having that boldness before the, the wicked judge and begging him justice, right? That's our boldness, right? That, that, that's our boldness is, is in that example. You know, our example of boldness is Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The blind man on the side of the road calling out, doesn't care who sees, you know, doesn't care who hears him, doesn't care what anybody thinks, he's willing to do anything to be saved, right? To, to just, to get Christ's attention. That's our boldness, right? The woman with the issue of blood, you know, barreling her way through a crowd, you know, completely disregarding any of the etiquette of the day to grab the hem of the Lord's garment, right? That's our boldness, right? The woman with the spike nard coming in and bearing the mocking and the shame of the hypocrites and the Pharisees for her wiping and we weeping over the Lord's feet and wiping her tears with her with her hair. Is that's our example of boldness, right? Okay, so 
Then, Father, speaking of your throat, <laughs> on the topic of tattoos from an orthodox perspective, the concept of imprinting certain symbols upon the flesh, would this be acceptable for someone attempting to walk the path? Does it depend on the symbols or is it something that should be avoided? Yes. Let me know if you need me to like. That's, that's from Rand, by the way. That's from, that's Rand, from Rand, from Wheel of Time, the Dragon yeah. Reborn. I, I would, you know, the, <clears throat> the, there's layers on the practical level. You should, you should talk with your spiritual director, your spiritual father, uh, and, and get an understanding of that. And I'm, I'm going to get into that. Why on a, on a real general generic sense. Yeah. Um, having images, symbols, um, you know, tattooing your body, <coughs> um, they become like armor, absolutely. Um, but the sword cuts both ways. And, um, you know, the thing is, the tattoo thing is interesting because the problem that we have with this question actually is I think more about the time we're living in than anything else. Because we're living in a time where the proliferation of not just tattooing, but images is so great in regards of not the quality, but the quantity, right? The quantity, like you see it everywhere. Images are so watered down, the power is taken from it. The power of tattooing is, <clears throat> is really, I mean, it was watered down because of the, the faddishness of it. You have to kind of suss that out first. Um, and there are these aspects to it, which I, I think are absolutely necessary for, in order for it to be, have any type of efficacy and, and validity. For instance, understanding it as a rite of passage, you know, understanding it um, to some degree as an ascetic endeavor, understanding it um, as the adornment of, of your temple, you know, um, because you know we're Orthodox, and what do Orthodox do with churches? You know, they <laughs> of all people we paint our churches. You know, so so there's a whole precedent there. But again, the problem is, is that for so many people now, it's just a faddish thing, and they just they mark their bodies because it's kind of like the cool thing to do, or they mark their bodies um, because they want to assimilate into a certain identity. Or they want to turn themselves into a monster, you know. Um, but this is this is not the Christian way of doing it, right? We we mark if we if we are to mark our bodies, we it needs to be done with an absolute sobriety and obedience to our spiritual father and you know a devotion to Christ. And I think you know the historical precedence of you know as early as you know. Um, Crusaders getting marked and even earlier than that, you know, one of the earliest tattoos we know of is of an Egyptian woman with a uh, um, St. Michael, Archangel Michael tattoo uh, on her leg. So, I mean, Christian tattooing is, Christians getting tattooed are, are Christians have been getting tattooed since, and since, since the beginning. Sure. The question is again, you know, um, the faddish foolishness of, of today. And that's where we get into, into the problem. Everything is vanity. Everything is vanity. And so of course there's a, there's a vain aspect to it and, and you can't get around that, you know, but there's a vain aspect to everything. Um, and so I think for someone who's contemplating it, I would say, you know, prayer, patience, understanding what you're gonna mark your body with, the symbol, what, what's the purpose? How's it gonna affect your life? Understanding who's gonna do it, that's another thing too. You be careful about who's tattooing you, not just because of the quality of their work, but who they are as a person, because you are forming a very intimate bond with someone. Um, and I, it's it, some very um, interesting situations can arise from that. And I would just discourage anyone from getting a tattoo from someone who they wouldn't have a, a greater measure of trust just beyond the tattooing, you know, them as a, as a person morally and spiritually, because 
those things, things can be transferred between you and someone who's who's cutting you um, to, to, to be very, you know. Uh, Do you have like a short example of that? Like, I don't understand like what that would mean. So <clears throat> you have to understand that the part of the problem with tattooing is that um, you can look at it just as a kind of standard procedure, but it's, it's not, right? Um, everything is imbued with spiritual potential and context. And so oftentimes, um, just speaking from experience, I have seen situations where artists have, <clears throat> you know, been blaspheming while they're preparing the stencil of Christ that they're going to tattoo on a guy. Oh, you, you should okay. Mean, like okay. that's that's not something like I'm just kind of like oh, hypothetical. Like I I've been there in the room when it's happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. And does um, that create an inversion then of the process? What happens? What what happens then? With yeah, that? you 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 have to understand that that in of itself is problematic because even even an indifference to the image of God is, is problematic when you are going to, you know, cut someone and, and tattoo them and, 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 and mark a person's body, right? Because it's, it's the lines and the, the line and, the, and, the, and the, the value, the shame, all, it all has meaning. Like it all has meaning and that, and that meaning, if it's being cursed, right? And I'm not saying the person, I'm not saying the person was hexing it and cursing. I'm just, I'm saying that the, that this person, you know, was blaspheming in a way that, you know, almost like how a materialist would, if you understand what I'm saying. But that doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? That doesn't make it. That doesn't. That doesn't negate what's happening there. Right, and it doesn't it doesn't negate the fact that if someone's coming in there, if you're coming in there as a faithful Christian, as a faithful Orthodox Christian, and you want something blessed, and understanding what that means, not blessed in a superstitious sense, right? Because blessings aren't superstition; blessings are spiritual, <laughs> right? They they absolutely affect um, the material of, of what's being blessed, like absolutely, right? But that blessing, right, there is an inversion to it, right? There, there is an inversion. And, and it can be as, as simple and as little as you now have, you can get a bad vibe, you can have a bad experience with that person. And now negative memories and emotions are attached to that image, which carry with you, which you carry with you for the rest of your life. And it's just one little crack of association, Right, it's 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 on the same level as when we when we say you gotta be careful about what you're watching, but be careful about what you listen to because those things they leave impressions on your soul. Right, those memories, those contexts, and those experiences leave impressions on your soul. Right, and they can be very hard to. Um, you can never really erase them, but they they're hard to redeem. If that makes sense. So sure. it's so it's more than the and it makes perfect sense even when you say it in that way like you could be someone could be totally materialistic about this and just be like look obviously there's you're imprinting more because there's pain involved because there's a process involved because there's something left from the process right. you're clearly you're going to be imprinting the event it's an imprinting <clears throat> of an event that's happening and depend and depend and then when you add in the spiritual dimension of these very powerful symbols, very powerful imagery, then it's like magnified. Would this be yeah. the same for iconography as well? Would this, yes, would this carry but, over for an icon? Yes. Well, yes. But before we go there, I just want to, I want to stop here real quick. Cause I think it's really important actually. This is part of the problem for the materialist. If they go down that line of thinking. Yeah. What if like, what if it is just that? 
That's the problem is you don't understand that that is what meaning and reality and eternity is. <laughs> do, you, do you see what I'm saying? That, that Yes, absolutely, 100%. Like, that's, that's what they don't get, right? And, and that's why I said this before, but like, I'll say it again here now. Let's just be really clear with everything that we're talking about and all the stuff that comes out of our mouths, I experience all this in the most mundane of things. In fact, as someone, you know, who did the whole ghost busting and trying to chase stuff and like, I mean, so much of my, so much of my pursuits in the quote unquote, you know, occult blah, 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 was this kind of pursuit of experience and, and, and all that. And what's interesting is the inversion of that, of deeper spirituality is finding stillness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's finding the profundity and the mundane. That is where the real discipline comes into play. And that is where the real mind blowers happen, right? I'll, I'll make it real simple. I knew my wife was the one for me because when I sat with her, I could sit with her for hours and not say anything. I didn't feel the need to entertain. I didn't feel the need to be like, oh, you know, like, okay, well, I'm kind of nervous. Well, let's do something fun, right? The one who just like always needs to have, you know, like, okay, let's, let, let me entertain you. Let's have fun, this and that. That's not, I, don't, I mean, and that rolls over into spirituality, right? These churches with, the the you know audio visual the, the the cappuccinos the rock band the whole thing which i get it i was there right it is it is such the opposite of actual spirituality not not out of some kind of buddhist posturing but because the reality is is that saint isaac the syrian right silence is the language of heaven and when you 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 don't know that until you actually experience it and once you've experienced that silence as he's, ex as he's explaining to us and as the fathers teach us, then you begin to see, right? And this is why things like, this is why the church is so adamant about children. The church is so adamant about, you know, fasting and fasting not being about um, just simply, you know, not eating or what you're eating, but simple foods, right? There, there's, there is a, a pace that the church leads us into. Iconography. Iconography is a fasting of the eyes, a fasting of the senses, right? Especially for us in this modern age with, again, the proliferation of images, everything is super saturated, everything's pow, like everything is just over the top, overwhelming you. And the icon, it brings you to this place, to, to a fast of the senses. That brings you into the, the simplicity and the profundity of the of the of the mundane. I just had to say that because it's I don't want people to mistake what we're talking about, you know. Well, the the point that you're making, and maybe I think maybe it would be good to expand on it a little bit. Um, and it's poignant right now. The you know, I sent you guys this this uh, Substack article from Naomi Wolf, who's mm -hmm. like, you know, huge materialist. Yeah. And for her to be you know, it, so this latest it stuff that, isn't it wild, you know, the fact wild. that she's like, well, we as intellectuals need to start talking about God because our, our lack of doing that has left us, she said like stupid and weak or something mm -hmm. like that, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I, it's, it's interesting because sort of these, it's, it's, there's been a pattern in my life. There's a couple of other people that I can, that I can think of off the, off the top of my head who are, let's say like Jewish by ethnicity. And were sort of raised, you know, they went to Hebrew school and that sort of thing, but then have like fallen off. They became very materialist, but now because they have that sort of, um, you know, you know, they, they have the vocabulary. And I think that, that was, she even mentioned it herself that like, yeah, well, yeah. at least in my tradition, I have a vocabulary of talking about the spiritual. So it's very easy for me to understand this is what's missing. They can see it, you know. Um, but I think this and this has been something that has has really been reoccurring for me, especially over the last two years, 
And orthodoxy is really like given me a framework for being able to express it. And you expressed it so well, that was a long way of saying, but like you expressed it so well that this idea that, well, even if we take to describe these things in the material, if we're really good at describing them and really effective and efficient at describing them, we basically will wind up at like what someone, what a saint could say in a sentence. Mm -hmm. Like it would take you a book as a materialist to say what a saint has already said mm -hmm. in a sentence as the conclusion. And it's like, it's a revelation, it's intuitive, it's all of these things and it just works, just follow it. You know, this, this, this is the, this is the, the gap, the, the bridging of the gap. I mean, in that, in that article, you know, where, where she says, no, it's just so monstrous. The evil is so monstrous that it's like, how do I say, and even her article is very, very long until she gets to like Ephesians, you know, right. it's like, it's powers right. and principalities here. And then it's just like, right. wait, that's it. That's the answer. Right. You know, but right. this, this has seemed to be the, this is the this is the part that it's almost like people don't want to jettison. This this is it. What I see is people don't want to jettison this like all the dead weight of materialism, even though they've already arrived at the spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. Like it's not enough mm -hmm. for them to be like, well, I'm okay. I went through all of this. I got here. Yeah, but you know what? Then it, it's that process is the same thing for even people when they're initiated. It's, it's, it's all a matter of veils, right? Moses had to wear a veil when he came to the children of Israel after he came down from the mountain because the glory was shining so, so greatly off of him they couldn't stand it. So they needed a veil to, to dim that glory. And so we're, we're the same way, right? We need these veils to, to shield us from the holiness. This let let's take a trip. Let, let's let's let, let, let's get into this a little bit, right? Because this this is like okay a, a big thing that we talk about, right? I mean, onion video, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, boom. So we need we 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 need veils. God doesn't need veils. Veils are a um a a mercy a a, a condescending you know mercies are, are a capitulation to us in our weakness right veils are there to show us and to 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 demonstrate to us the sanctity the separateness the holiness of a thing but also to shield us from the the revelatory purifying awesomeness of holiness you know what I mean? A symbol is precisely that. A symbol is a veil. When you really begin to understand, right? This is why it's so important to move beyond just the, just move beyond the psychological and kind of Jungian understanding of symbol and get into how the church understands symbol. Okay, wait. So are you saying, so this is interesting. So that's an interesting way of understanding it. So truth, so truth, God is over here. And then you have this sort of proceeding from that mm -hmm. out, there would be veils, like layers, mm -hmm. layers of veils, maybe like mm -hmm. the temple, the courts, mm -hmm. the different courts yes. in the temple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that- It's all a veil. Yes, yeah, symbol is somewhere here. Symbol is here. Mm -hmm. but, but a Jungian understanding is like several veils I mean, away from the symbol way way several 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 right 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 and so interesting and yeah. so you have to you have to understand that that's that's why um that's why like like when you get into like young and archetypes and everything it's it's helpful because it can help so it, help, it can help a quote-unquote strict materialist to begin to wrap their mind around metaphysics and around quote unquote the spiritual but you have to understand how far removed it is from the thing it, it, it's meaning the understanding right because a true understanding of a true symbol 
is radiating the thing within it. Like it's imbued with, with that thing in itself, right? And so, I think even Jung would agree with that because he was having the experiences. Mm -hmm. And it was it was making him go crazy because he didn't have the he he didn't have an orthodox perspective he didn't right. have that framework right he didn't have he didn't have proper veils yes he didn't but have, he he offered veils but they were they were the, they weren't right it's like interesting it's like no right now is not the time for lace right now is the time for brocade and silk or how you know however you want to look at it right but. But this is the thing, this is why, quote unquote, religion, but, but to be more accurate, ritual and sacrament is so important because those veils are for us, right? They're for us. Let me give you an example. See, this whole time I'm like, I'm, I'm debating because I, I like what I'm about to give is a, well, may, may it be a blessing to, to people. Words are veils and symbols. I might have said this before. You can hear a word from a saint and go like, man, that's really good. Uh, you can say like, man, that's, that's you know, spirit-filled, that's, that's divine, like divinely inspired, all that stuff. And, and you, can, you can go like, yeah, like that's good, right? Um, St. Paisios says something, you're like, man, wow, that's really good, right? When Christ says something, it's it's you can't even compare the two. You can if 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 you if you have disciplined yourself, right? If you submitted yourself, if you have the experience, if you purify yourself enough, you can start discerning the difference between the two, right? And forgive me if it's a broken record, but I think it's totally good to bring this up again. I'll give you a great example of what I'm talking about, right? Um, my brother is my life. That's really good. You, that's like, wow, that's simple it's to the point. It's like, it's got a lot of layers, you know? That's Saint Silouan. Saint Silouan said that. My brother's my life, right? Okay. Keep thy mind in hell and despair not. Whoa. I mean, you can feel it even when I say it. Qualitatively different. Okay, well, yeah, it's deep. It's it's a mystery. It, it, it's, it's like it's, echoes. Yeah, quality. Like, keep that mind in hell. And despair not. Here's the thing, right? Both of those words are come from Siloan. However, only one of them is one of them is actually the word of Christ. That's what Christ said to Siloan, and you can feel it. The words of Christ have certain qualities to them right there's they're true they're beautiful they're 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 terrifying they are um there is a there's a sense of paradox to them there's a sense of eternity to them when the lord speaks something it's always very simple but it's 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 never crude right it's never primitive the Lord's simplicity is the thing that the Lord's simplicity is the um, the Lord's simplicity is the the conduit by which eternity is traveling. You you begin to tap into eternity when you when you commune with Him through His words. It's it's qualitatively different, right? Qualitatively different. So. Even these things are veils. The words of a saint reveal to you a, a measure and experience of holiness, which is qualitatively different than the words of God himself, right? And, and moving past that, you, you, you even move past that, which this is the whole thing about hesychasm. You move past that and you experience something beyond even those veils, which is the silence. Right. And si silence it, it is silence because the silence isn't isn't a veil. Right. Is it a vacuum? What is it? What how, no, how no, do no, we it's not a vacuum. How do we so I how mean, do we understand I that? I mean, Christ is the silence. 
Got it. And that and that sense, right? Got it. He has that stillness in that sense. But even even then, even then, because you have to understand, we will spend all of eternity searching his deaths. Right? The six-winged seraphim, with two they fly, with two they cover their feet, with two they cover their faces, right? They are veils. <laughs> you know what I mean? The seraphim are. Are these living seraphim are are they are contemplation that's what they are right that's what they do they are contemplation they contemplate god that's their existence right but they are also in some regards understanding them as they are veils if you if you begin to understand that the energies of god and how the energies of god pass through and and they come to us eventually through the sacraments i mean you you begin to understand like all those veils all those layers they're necessary for, for, because of our weakness, right? Getting back to the onion video, like w- like when you have these exp- when you have these experiences with God. Getting back to Saint Simon, the, the new theologian, talking about earlier, when you've had experiences with God, you're you're left speechless. You're left in silence. You're left on your face. You're left in stillness. You're left enraptured in terror. You're, you're, you're left in so many things that it can only be encapsulated in, in the symbol of silence. It's ineffable. It's beyond your ability to articulate it. I have a quick question uh, on the keep that mind in hell and despair not. Um, and Man of God, that movie about St. Nectarios, did you... Um, there's like a part where it shows Athos mm-hmm. and where they're like on Athos. Father, do you remember what I'm talking about? I think so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, did they show St. Silvan for a second? I meant to ask you about that on Sunday because there's a guy who's standing there for like, and I don't mean to derail, we'll come back, but I just got to ask this. There's like a part where they're standing, they're doing prostrations in a cave. Yeah. Um, and then there's just a guy standing there for like one second. He's just keep thy mind in hell and despair not. And then that's the only thing you see from him the entire movie. And I didn't know if they just like had like, did you, do you think that was St. Silouan? Like, I don't know, like, because I, the one thing I had about that, again, I don't mean to derail is is like, if you weren't familiar with St. Nectarios's life, that movie wouldn't really make much sense mm-hmm. because there's like this like five minute thing where they cut away to Athos as he's leaving that initial village he got sent to before he's heading to the school. Um, and I don't know if it's him on Athos or not. And then they like run into like, I don't remember who, but then they're doing prostrations in the cave. And then there's that guy and he's like standing there for like one second, like kind of like looking at the cameras, like keep yeah. that mind in hell. In the sp- so that was most likely St. Silouan. I'm assuming. That's kind of what I thought. Is that the same, the same gen- time generation? That's what I was thinking, which is right. like, hey, that, yeah, that adds up. It adds up that like, yeah. So um, then, on keep thy mind in hell and despair not like because there's so much that could be said about that which obviously makes it the words of christ but like if somebody had not heard that before could you kind of like maybe just give like a brief synopsis like like on a very surface level of like because i'm knowing protestant people who are listening to this Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I would explain keep thy sure. mind in hell and despair not. <clears throat> so, I mean, to make it real uh, as much as possible, um, the context of that is that Saint Silouan, um, who was a very advanced, spiritually advanced uh, monk, had a, had a very early experience of, of Christ and received a lot of grace from that experience and lost it. Um, And the loss of that grace of Christ due to pride um, just put him in years of agony, absolute years of just agony um, and spiritual struggle. Interestingly enough, he he fell into pride because uh, a spiritual uh, spiritual father had had complimented him basically said to him you know basically if if you're this advanced now this age lord have mercy what what will you be in 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 the future and from that it hit him and he fell into pride and 
<coughs> it's just tanked his boat for years, for years, 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 like uh, like eleven years. No, no grace. And so he had gotten to this point one night. He wanted to just with everything in his being, he wanted to worship God. He wanted that grace back because he Christ had came to him, and he wanted that that grace of actually seeing the Lord himself again. And when he wanted to worship um, in front of him, in front of the icon in his cell appeared a demon. And the demon says to him, bow down, you know, and worship me, you know? And he was just struggling and fighting and just almost about to just give in to the, to the battle and be defeated. And Christ, you know, speaks to him and says, the proud are always afflicted by devils. And then, you know, the civil one says something, but then the Lord says to him, keep that in mind. He's like, Lord, I want to worship you. What am I to do? Basically, he says to him, keep that mind in hell and despair not. And so this is a profound thing. I mean, there's, we could literally, pro we could spend every podcast from here on out talking about this, right? Yes. But to give some sort of summation, the best way for someone who is a Protestant to understand, or the best way for someone who's not Orthodox, the best way for someone who hasn't had um, a measure of initiation, they don't have a spiritual father, they don't have someone to guide them in this, the best way that, to understand that is the struggles that you're having, allow them to be, for you, humility. Don't leave that place of humility and trust that my mercy will save you. Coming back around to yeah, yeah, right? yeah. just understand it that way, right? Don't leave that place of humility, right? Keep thy mind in hell. Keep thy mind in this place of struggling and 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 striving. And yes, does that sound counterintuitive to your experience? Absolutely does, and that's part of the problem. It's mm -hmm. probably part of the reason why you're watching this podcast right now, because you've been swimming in shallow waters your whole life, right? But this is where the deep, cool water is. So that struggle with humility, that struggle against your pride and your projections, and even your, your tendency to idolatry, all of those things you need to spend your time fighting with them. And in doing so, the mercy of God will be revealed to you. And you will have confidence in that mercy of God. On the idolatry front, because it was because it's been in, in my mind, I think it it's maybe, especially right now, and as this comes out, what I'm seeing, and it's interesting because people are reaching out to me from all different sides. And um, expressing to me their concerns about the various, let's say, the various groups that they're associated with, that I have been associated with it at times. And the theme that keeps coming through is how, how far to the right-hand side of the royal path toward correctness people are, are going as a reaction to the things that have happened over the last two years. And in, in a desire for, I think as this narrative falls apart, that's, that's come from the, the wokes, like a desire for retribution in some ways, a desire, you know, but latching onto the correctness as like, okay, and now we build and now don't forget, don't forget what they did. Don't, for, don't forget, we're not going to forgive. And here's the, this purity test of whatever and it's this this but it seems like all of the things that they're gravitating toward and the way that they're approaching them and perhaps this is happening in orthodoxy I, being here on this island i'm far enough removed and i mean this this would be whatever maybe there are some people within this as well but it seems like things that are being latched onto are not christ they're like they may be aspects of the church they may be certain practices they may be certain things that are done they may be certain not the tradition but certain traditions that people are latching onto and but they're latching onto them in an idolatrous way and i just 
or at least what appears to me from what's being described to me as an idolatrous way. And I just, I was hoping that we could talk about like idolatry so that, because you've helped me to understand it so much better as opposed to just like, oh yeah, I've got this idol of a mm -hmm. Ganesh that I'm worshiping or whatever. Mm -hmm. But instead as a, like a mindset, and I think there's a lot of things that people are being idolatrous toward right now that most people would not, would be like, what, that's idolatry. So I was hoping that we could talk about that a little bit. It's just been on my mind this week because of all. Yeah. This. Yeah. I mean, um, a man can have an, can make an idol out of his, his wife's body parts and completely lose his wife. The Jews made an idol out of the, the, their Levitical practices and their heritage as the, um, the heralds, you know, they were the heralds of Yahweh, you know, um, in the same way the silver surfer was the herald for like Galactus, you know, without the weird whatever, but like they were to go forth and they were to proclaim the coming of the Lord. That was their job. Um, and they made an idol out of that vocation, that calling, that inheritance. They made an idol of it and that idol separated them from God. Um, idolatry often begins when someone takes the portion and makes it the whole right so the egyptians worship bost bost was the cat god or cat goddess right the egyptians weren't wrong when they saw a god in the cat they were wrong when they made the cat god right uh when you know this is this is a, this is a great example too because this is actually something this is a polemic or this is something people use against iconography against icons but it actually works the opposite way right it's um Nishtan, the the serpent of brass right and they had to take you know they were commanded to destroy it unless they made an idol out of it right well god's the one who told him to make it in the first place right so the problem isn't the serpent of brass being made, the problem was their tendency towards idolatry. And the idolatry is, okay, forget God, this thing helped us, right? And, and it get, kind of gets back to the veils, right? People, they want to hold on to the veil. They, they want the veil, not God, right? In fact, <laughs> you know, people, God's Moses, like Moses, Moses, you go talk to God for us because he's too terrifying, right? Moses was a veil that they put up for themselves. Are you, are you following me, right? Yes, Moses had a veil over his face, but Moses himself was a veil because they didn't want to encounter. God wanted to be with them, but they're like, no, 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 it's too much. Moses, you go do it, right? This taking the portion and making the whole. Oh, yeah, we'll have moral purity. We'll have, we'll have moral correctness, right? We hate the gays, uh, we hate the wokes, we hate the whatever, and we hate the atheists. And so because we hate them, we're gonna be orthodox, right? Okay, well, so, okay, great. You may have good moral standing, you may have good moral practices. Okay, that's great, but you're missing mercy, you're missing love, you're missing compassion, right? And so, and so that's the thing is, you know, the, the devil is all about the right side. But let me, let me give everyone an understanding. The easy part is, it's a lot easier, I'm speaking from experience, it's a lot easier for me to get someone off of cocaine, prostitutes, and violence. That's I don't want to make it seem like that's easy, but it's simple. I, I, I can do it, you know, with God's help. I've done it with God's help. You know, it's really tough is getting people away from arrogance and pride and self-righteousness and, you know, uh, hardness of heart. Especially right? after they got off the cocaine and the prostitutes. And Especially all, and, and the after whiskey, they got off yeah. the cocaine, the prostitutes and everything else. Now that's, that's the real difficult thing, right? So 
this idolatry of self, this Luciferic temptation, which is what it is, this, this is the great concern. And, and to be frank, um, I cannot remember the father that has said it. It's a neptic father. It doesn't feel like but I'll, I'll go back and I'll look for it if, if, with God's help. But he talks about it's, it's actually better to fall into errors of the left than the right, actually. You know, it's better that you fall into, gl- like, you don't want to fall into any of them, right? But it's, it's better you fall into gluttony and, and lust and drunkenness than you fall into judgment and pride and self-righteousness, right? Look, the publican and the Pharisee, right? The publican, you know, beats his breast and says, God, forgive me a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me a sinner. The Pharisee's like, Psh, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this dude. I'm not like these men, right? So it's really important to understand that. And, and it's, it's the total, like no one has a lens for, from my perspective. You know, like I know um, I did that interview with Brother Augustine, whatever, however long ago it was. And, and that was really good because that's what him and I connected on initially was like, we were both concerned about this issue of, of the, the temptation from the right and the hyper-conservatism and all that. It's like, he's one of the only ones I know of that's actually has that on the radar. Like it's a real problem. And to be frank, it's where atrocities begin. Atrocities don't always, atrocities, always, you know what I mean? That's, that's where the atrocities are going to happen. Um, I, I think that, and, and we've been talking about this. I mean, this is why we started the real path in many ways, right? Because this worry about this, what's coming, what's going to come from the right, from the overcorrection, because no one's seeing it. No one is seeing it. And it's going to blindside a lot of people. A lot of people, God forbid, are going to be swept up in it is everything you just said we won't forget and this and that and you know Byzantium and like whatever they whatever they're thinking you know what I mean they want to like let's go kill people like I mean that that is a very horrific thing and you know again like I always tell people people think that the antichrist is going to be a 500 pound black crack smoking lesbian you know what i mean and it's not it's not the antichrist he people just think they won't hear that they just they just want to think of you know the the big hook nose (laughs) like you know jewish caricature from like world war ii that's what they think the antichrist is i'm like man like you don't get it like if if you if you do not understand this concept of of the narrow road, right? If, if you do not understand this concept of the narrow road and you are not struggling to be on the royal path, you are in grave danger of falling into the error on the right. The idea of, I think, yeah, it does <clears throat> merge very well for me and I can totally see it. This idea of taking the veil that, okay, here the veil is very useful, but then taking the veil and saying, and stopping basically Mm -hmm. is the idolatry, right? Is that it's like, it's not a a sense of purification Mm -hmm. to do the work of purification Mm -hmm. so that you may step beyond this veil Mm -hmm. to the next chamber, as it were, to step Mm -hmm. beyond that veil to the next chamber, which is going to require purification at every step is to Mm -hmm. say, oh, how wonderful this veil, how beautiful this veil, how Mm -hmm how intricate, how marvelous, and mm-hmm. oh, isn't it wonderful to be within this courtyard and this is everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. As opposed to an idea of this, yes, this is, wow, it's wonderful that we've approached into this courtyard, but still there's a, a, another veil and that requires purification. Mm-hmm. Is, and, and that is the exact thing that is, that's, that's exactly it of what's, what people are describing to me right now. That's the exact, the exact yeah, and, notion. And, yeah. and I would just say, this is something I bring up often. I know it's, I know for a lot of people, like it, it can be, it's one of the things I, I don't think I do. I, I do not think I do a good enough job explaining it, but like, that's why we're not moralists because moralists and moralism is another kind of veil. 
and it's contingent upon certain things that aren't necessarily eternal. They're not necessarily like God, right? So you can have a idolatrous apprehension of your morality, of moralism, right? And this is super dangerous because what happens is, is that people, because this idolatrous tendency to it, they begin to see like, I'm pure, right? I have this moral standing, but what it is is like, they don't understand it's like, I made myself pure because I have adhered to the purity laws and I have made sure to put the time in to do whatever. And I have, you know what I mean? And I can measure whatever it is, whether it's my pedigree, my whatever, you know? And, and, and this is, you see this in so many things. You see it in the kind of professional, the professionalism, <clears throat> The careering that happens, unfortunately, like in seminaries and things like that, right? Oh, I did this. I studied this and that. Therefore, I am, and it's like, you know, St. Simon, the new theologian, again, forgive me for quoting so much of him tonight, but it's like, he says, you know, God uses all, God uses all, but does not, or, but does not um, ordain all. Right. So like St. Simeon's talking about like, yeah, there's tons of priests in this day that are getting ordained and God uses them, but he didn't ordain them. Mm. Mm. That's St. Simeon, the new theologian. And that's important to understand because someone can take that and, and there's a grace that's there. It's not, it's not, the grace is not contingent upon someone, but at the same time, right. It's not to be wielded in of itself separate from God. I mean, at that point, you're getting into magic. At that point, you're getting into, I mean, divine right of king. Like, it's, it's not the priesthood, right? And if we want to take that concept, that, I'm, that principle, excuse me, that principle that I'm laying out, let's just apply that to the, the priesthood of the, of the believers. Because there's a priesthood of all believers, right? Every believer, when you're chrismated, right, the christening, that you're being anointed, right? The, the anointed one. A Christian is an anointed one, right? And that anointing is a priestly facet, it's a priestly vocation, right? And the christening, it has this, this prophetic aspect to it and this kingly aspect to it. And all those things, the Christian, each Christian enters into this to some degree. Now, not in a sacramental sense like myself, but nevertheless, that aspect is there. And no one ever holds it, including myself or any bishop. No one holds it in of themselves, right? It's all Christ's priesthood that's given, right? And that's not morality. That's that's calling. That's vocation. That's ontology. That's it's 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 it it, it isn't a moral system, right? And this is really important, I think, because this is why the lives of the saints are so important. Because the lives of the saints will shatter your moralism. Mm. There's so many saints that you're like, what? She just spit in his face? What? Yeah. That that saint just spit in his face and was run through. I mean, even like, and again, I just saw it, so this is what I'm talking about, but even in Man <laughs> of God, there's a part where a person walks up to St. Nectarios and was like, I really like your writings. And he and St. Nectarius is like, is there any way to publish them so we can distribute them? And like the moralistic part of me is like, well, that's very arrogant of him. Like, that's very arrogant to think that like your writings are so important that they need to be published and distributed. Like, that's very like, that's not very humble of you, but it's like, oh, wait, no, that's, that's not the point. I'm missing the point then. Right. There's like um, a, a line in a um, Me Without You song where he said, I've surrendered myself to... I surrendered my love to emblems of kindness and not the kindness they were emblems of. Mm -hmm. So it's like totally taking a step back and being like, I really, um, oh, what am I doing? What? Okay, yeah, I'll finish the thought, but it's like, it's just repeating. But um, I was talking to my friend Stevie one time and he said something along the lines of like, well, I don't get why we can't worship the earth. Like, can the earth not be God? And out of nowhere, I was just like, well, it kind of be like if I made you like like a CD with like all of the things, all of these songs about our friendship that I think meant a lot to me, you know, and like I gave you that CD, 
I was like, hey man, this is like my from my love to you. This is like a bunch of songs that reminds us of like our good times together, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you started like spending all your time with that CD. And then like you like just like all only like hung out and like I would be like, hey man, do you want to hang out? And you'd be like, no, I'm too busy listening to like the CD I gave you. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but I mean, I'm like, I'm right here. I'm still the guy that's right. wanting to hang out with you. But like you're the guy that's like, no, I just really gotta listen to the CD again. And I'm like, okay, well. I think you're mixing something up here. Like, I think that you're like... Can I stop real quick, Andrew? Because That's so common, by the way. It's so common, and it's actually a really excellent example. And I'm going to tell you why. It's, it's so perfect. Beyond the kind of like, oh, like, you know, kind of like chuckles about it. Think about it in real time or, or in like the real world what that would look like. Well, yeah, because that person is enjoying the music. They are able to, it's, it's, it's self-gratifying, if you understand what I'm saying when I say that, mm-hmm. right? They're able to enjoy the music and there isn't any effort, right? The effort that's expended to enjoy the music on my own and, it, and I own, it's like, it's this kind of personal experience of, that I'm able to own and have and possess and enter into and listen to music. But when the but when the real person is there, I have to be vulnerable. I have to, you know what I mean? I have to put in work. I have to communicate. Do you, do you understand where I'm going with that? Like go deeper with that with that example. And you begin to see the problem with it. It's like all the nostalgia. You can think of like all the good times we had together and stuff, you know, and then you get nothing but the good stuff. And it's just like, like all- yeah, but but I don't want anyone to lose what I'm trying to say here. Because I love music. I can just tune everyone out and just listen to music, right? And that's a problem. That's what I'm trying to say. It's a problem that I can do that. Because what it is, is I don't want to do, I don't want to deal with the mess of someone. It's messy. Like, yeah, there's a lot of that right now, Father. Do you, do you understand what there's I'm saying? A lot, yes. There's a lot of like this whole, like, which is coming out now, this whole like, put the manos- buds in, manosphere, MGTOW. But I mean, on a, on a, people who want like the idea they they like the idea of a relationship for instance like the idea of marriage you know these guys who who have turned these young guys that i see them they're talking about traditional marriage all the time and all of these things and it's like you know and oh this these thoughts over here and all this thing and that no i'm looking for woman traditional marriage and all of this and it's like yo like but but if you're going to be in a marriage, there's going to be a real human being there with you. Oh. And like your marriage is the relationship of you with this human being, not your idea of her, not your idea of what a marriage is, but like the, the good times, the bad times, the sickness and health till death do you part with another human being. Yes. Which ain't easy, Jack. Mm. <laughs> which ain't easy well and and you know what it's what i know with my wife and i have to constantly remind myself is like compared like i flip the tables and i'm like yo she's with you you're the (laughs) most one of the most difficult people you couldn't spend you can barely spend time alone with yourself you know what i mean and and look at she's a saint to look at her (laughs) you know what i mean you have to deal with one of the most low maintenance, easy, beautiful women you could possibly imagine. She has to deal with you, knucklehead. So I will constantly <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> I got the better end of this deal. For sure. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Oh, Lord have mm-hmm. mercy. I forget mm-hmm. what saint it was, Father. I'm sure you know who it is. Um, but the, the guy that came to the the elder or the saint, I can't remember, and said, uh, should I get father? Should I get married? And the saint said, yes, because if it's a good woman, then you'll be happy. And if it's a bad woman, you'll become holy. And it's like, yeah, no, absolutely. Not that my wife. That's good. good. (laughs) But the idolatry of the, yeah, the idolatry of the concept. But that's, yeah, that's idolatry in and of itself. Yeah. And I'm sure that you mm-hmm. just touched on that. But like, that's that whole thing of like, it sounds so much, it's like, for me, it's like bacon. Like bacon always smells so much better than it actually tastes. It's like the concept of bacon, the, the culture around bacon, it's always so much better than when I actually eat it. I'm like, oh, this 
gross greasy pork is just like sitting in my stomach and it's not good but it smelled so good and the anticipation is like oh we're gonna have bacon for breakfast this morning it's like awesome cool and then you got to deal with the grease afterwards it's just sitting in this gross pan and you're like well what do i do with this now it's yeah yeah cook with it <laughs> yeah i know but man also, you put that bacon grease you mix it with some butter you get yourself a steak you baste that bad boy put some thyme in it oh man facts Sorry. that's facts right there <laughs> we should have a recipe episode uh like my friend uh just became a catechumen and he's really really into cooking so i'm getting this whole different side of orthodoxy now as like the cooking of orthodoxy, the recipes of having to go into orthodoxy and stuff. Before we get too sidetracked, I think we got enough time to cover this last question. Uh, there's one, another one, and we'll get to it later on, but it's a lengthy one. Um, and I think that this one's good. This one's from um, M Film Trip. Does Father Turbo have any suggestions for reading about Tsar Nicholas? I would say for reading, I, I want to expand this to reading about holy russia in particular mm. or in general yeah because okay and i i won't be long but i was just talking to my wife about this we were talking about rasputin i have no idea okay i just don't know what's up with this dude because there's very very and father maybe you know i'm sure you know more than i do about this but there's this whole narrative about who this Wait, guy did we is. talk about rest i'm sorry to interrupt you did we talk about rasputin on on, on one of our episodes have we talked about rasputin it seems like we would, we should have by now. Yo, this is like, he keeps coming up so in my conversations that I've been having. Just, I just got to say this really quick. I don't know what to believe about this guy because a woman I know, a sister in Christ from the church who is extremely well-versed in Russian history, brought up to me like three years ago. She, it was like one of those moments just planting the seed of doubt in my brain of like, have you heard it seeming more and more like this guy was maligned by the communists that like the agenda that was coming to fruition around the Russian revolution was basically made up a bunch of stuff about this guy. I have no idea one way or the other. I've always seen him as like, okay, yeah, he was doing miracles, but they weren't miracles of God. Like this dude was obviously into some wicked, wicked stuff. But then I started to think about like, okay, was he just maligned? I have no idea. So anyway, that's if we could throw that in there somewhere, because that dude is several episodes worth by himself, but or maybe like one episode by himself. But um, so, Father, what's what's up with Rasputin really quick before we get to the other thing? I mean, honestly, this one's a bit out of my depth, too, because I, I I'm. We should have that sister on to talk about it sometime. We should. You know, I, I, I'm yes. familiar with the argument that he's maligned. Um, the only, there's, there's only a couple of things for me, though, that I struggle with with that thought. And, and at this point, I would just have to say, you know, the caveat and the disclaimer is like, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm ignorant, you know, so I, I'm, I don't want to comment on it because I don't know. But I know that the, um, as I understand it, the cult that he was accused of being a part of was like a real thing, you know? Um, so I don't know, you know, I, I'm going to plead the fifth on this one. Uh, Cause I'm just, I'm out of my depth on it in regards of Rasputin. Um, in regards of <clears throat> Tsar Nicholas, I would encourage, I would encourage, um, there is, it's recently released and this may seem kind of odd, but follow me on this one. Um, I have this book here, actually. Oh, I'm really sorry. I just needed to say this. I was talking with this about my wife about Rasputin. This is the whole point I was getting to, is I need to find a Russian Orthodox priest, not culturally Russian, or that's from like Des Moines, Iowa, and then became a Russian. I need to find like a Russian Orthodox priest whose English is a second language. And I need to ask about like what he thinks happened during the Russian Revolution and everything, like what happened with the Holy Family, what happened with Rasputin, what I've is got, I've got one who I think might know. I'll put you in contact. He's the one who showed up here on the island. I think he, no. he of all people, would be able to, yeah. Not Father, not Father because, Kirill. Not yeah. because I'm going to take that as truth, but because I just want to know what the, the Russian Orthodox, because they are so not, not bad, just wonky. They're just like, 
oh, okay, I didn't know that that was a thing. But like, yeah, obviously that's a thing. I want to know culturally what has resonated with the Russian Orthodox Church since mm -hmm. 1917, like since that whole thing happened. Like, I just kind of want to know, not because I'm going to, okay, that's what happened, but like another voice to be in there to add like to the equation. So anyway, I'm sorry, I'm done, Father. Well, in any situation like this, it's always good to pray. And if you really wanted to know something, ask God to help you understand the opinion that he wants you to hold on it. Seek truth and not just kind of entertainment, not just trivia and facts. Well, yeah. Don't, don't, don't pursue it as in like from a kind of critical perspective of like, you know, because you're repenting of that. You're repenting of that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't got time for that anymore. I don't so have just, time. I would pray about it and then wait on it and kind of like put it aside and allow God to bring it forth, which leads me to what I was going to bring up by this book here, The Catacomb Saints. And it's, there's copies of it kind of floating around. I have, I'm very blessed to have an original copy. Um, there's copies of it floating around and Father Peter Hears has been doing some really great um, lectures on it. And it seems like it's not connected, but I would encourage anyone, if you really want to understand, quote unquote, what's the deal with the czar, kind of work your way through it from that perspective. Don't approach it in a kind of historical, uh, critical analysis. Approach it through the lives of those who are suffering under the yoke of communism under the demonic terror, those who suffered and, and they, those who were preserving the faith, understand what they were experiencing, how they're living. And there's actually some things that are explicit in there that will kind of give you an insight of how they felt about the czar. Um, there is a service for the czar. You can read the hymnography in the church uh, about about you know the czar and his family um and i think that you'll get more from that than you will you know these these kind of biographical uh takes on it because yeah history um, maligns him yeah and history you know i just i'm really leery of these things because you know history maligns christ there's there's <laughs> another there's it, it's almost more important to understand that when you look at Tsar Nicholas, you have to look at Tsar Nicholas with a Christ-centered lens. If you're looking at him from a worldly perspective, you're gonna miss it and you're gonna get whatever the world tells you. But if you look at it from, a, from the lens of Christ and you look at it as, you also look at him as that last Christian ruler, you'll start getting some, things will become a little bit more clear for you. I think, I think I'll, I wanna end on this because again, um, I know people who are just experts in this, I'm not one, but I do have personal devotion to him. Hmm. Um, and I have personal devotion to him primarily through my personal devotion to St. Elizabeth. Hmm. I, have a, I have a very deep devotion to St. Elizabeth um, and I think when you begin to understand, you know, one of the biggest things that many of us need to repent of is imbibing this kind of critical theory approach to things like monarchy. Hmm. And now I'm not a monarchist. I'm not standing like, we need to bring the czar back. I'm not saying that, right? Because that time has passed now and we need to, what, what's coming next for us is theocracy. Where like I don't want to embrace anything else. Everything has be has been de deconstructed. Everything has been entropy has set in. So now all that's left for us is his revealing, is his coming. There is no uh, there is no more earthly kingdoms. Every system has been done. There's nothing left. All that's left is theocracy. All that's left is Christ to come and to rule and reign. That's it, right? So I'm not wanting to go back, right? But that being said, it's also important to understand that for many of us, we've been tainted with the view of these things. And I think that one of the benefits, and there isn't many, <laughs> there isn't many, 
But one of the benefits that we do have in this point in time from my perspective is we can try to see history and we can try to see the office of czar and king and all that from a royal path perspective. We don't have to go all the way to the right and make an idol out of it and be like, oh, a king and czar is like the ultimate thing, you know, but we also don't have to go to the other side and be like, oh yeah, it's all corrupt. It's all this, it's all that. Democracy, like anarchy, like no, we don't have to do either one of those, right? We can look at it and see, see it for what it is. We can see it that God used it. God never wanted kings, you know what I mean? But, but it's a capitulation, right? But if you're going to have a king, let there be a righteous king. Let the king be a symbol for the ultimate kingship. All that good stuff, right? But if you're going to get into the czar, you get into czar Nicholas. First, you have the only way to do it is to look at it from a from a from orthodox Christian lens, meaning spiritually the personhood of Christ, the kingship of Christ. Boom. Boom. That's good. Yeah, because I mean, I'm repenting now and I'm having to pray to that guy um, of that no, saint. Sorry, not that guy, that saint. Because for a long time, I was hypercritical of him because I like World War One, And then he doesn't, if you look at it from a certain lens, he doesn't come across as looking so great. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I'm hypercorrecting a little bit. And, yeah, and, and it, it's a good thing to remember too, because one of my favorite lines, I like to scandalize, I actually got this one from Dr. James Cone, but Christ was a failure too. Mm -hmm. he, he utterly failed from a, <laughs> you know from a worldly from a worldly perspective absolutely from a worldly perspective he utterly failed you I'm didn't hear me absolutely. you didn't hear me say the obi one quote it's from a certain point of view from a certain point of view from a certain point of view so if you guys had to pick a couple of your favorite actors in your favorite era of snl what would they be? Wait, so we get to pick one era? Just or, do whatever you want. One, Just one <laughs> do an era, then a couple actors you like. Like, I know, I know probably one of my favorite times was the Farley era. Um, sure. That's, that's 10, that's when I tend to go back and watch the most is a lot of those skits. And Matt Foley is like one of the greatest, I mean, skits of all time of any, any like, you know, skit show. Um, but I mean, actors, I would have to do Phil Hartman without. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to put Phil Hartman. With I was going to say Phil Hartman too. Yeah. Phil Hartman. Yeah. But then I mean, also Chris Farley. And then I've always had a thing, not like romantically, but a thing for Tina Fey. Politics aside, I think she's absolutely brilliant. I think her humor is like, she just gets me. Politics aside, I mean, I'm not crazy into her as a person at all, but like her humor is, her humor is pretty on point for me. I mean, in terms of in terms of eras where the cast was was great, but where the standout that there was a standout. I mean, Will Ferrell. Well, mm, yeah. Really? I'm not crazy about Will Ferrell. Dude, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong there. Something's wrong there. I'm like, the guy just... that we sit and watch Anchorman, and I'm just like. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand how you can't find a few. I, I, th I think he's a Jewish. But this is what I will say. When I go back to like the earlier eras and I look at the skits and maybe it's just because it's so much of SNL is just not evergreen. Mm -hmm. So much of SNL is like period. It's like of the era. Sure. But still there are you can go back to to Eddie Murphy with mm -hmm. with his that he had and they all stand up yeah. every single thing that eddie murphy did where it was like his where it, he wasn't just coming in but like it was his mr robinson's neighborhood buckwheat the buckwheat stuff like mm -hmm. all, all that like totally stands up but when i go back and i look at that whole era i can appreciate it for like class it's classic like nostalgia all of it but there are not as many of the skits that just really hold up but eddie murphy everything that he did on that show definitely but those would be my two eddie murphy will ferrell i can't believe you don't like will ferrell he's just kind of a one can't note believe guy. it can't believe it just, i don't know he's kind of a one note guy and i'm also like remember i grew up on the era because i'm just a teensy bit younger than you yeah i grew up on the era where he made one funny movie and he rode that for like the next th like two decades 
Wait, like what his, is the one? Fu- what is the movie that you think is his one funny movie? Anchorman. And then, you like, think, you don't think Talladega Nights is funny? He there. That movie Bro. is funny. I don't think he's that funny in it. John C. You don't, Reilly, think, you don't like, think step? Well, yeah. John C. Riley's genius, but that's the same with Step Brothers too. Okay, but yeah, I read watched Step Brothers not too long ago, and again, like whatever, I'm not going to hold it against the movie. It doesn't really hold up that well. It's like okay, and like a lot of the funniest quotes from that movie are not from Will Ferrell. And it's like the Dane Cook pay per view, twenty minutes. Let's go! Like that is awesome. That's absolutely hilarious. Yes. That's not Will Ferrell. And well, like when you true. go through and you hear a lot of those lino ramas because I love the lino ramas. I think they're absolutely brilliant. Like his are not funny, and they're ultimately like extremely lewd like and that's always going to be a turnoff for me fair enough they just make up for their lack of funniness with just being like very lewd i'm not into that like and I, th- I think you are i think you are um that like blades here's the board. thing without without will ferrell i don't i don't think any of those any of those are funny like john c Riley's great but with except for him being with yeah, like with will ferrell you just that's kind of like him. that's kind of like seth rogan seth rogan's never funny but without him mm. the movie wouldn't be funny yeah that's true like seth rogan is never like i don't really that's like true. seth rogan either like he's just like and the other thing is is like i think will ferrell just kind of seems like a jerk i'm just like i'm just not into it and like dude when i was in my house and on partying days the guys who liked anchorman were the dudes that were like chugging Bud Light and smashing the cans on their head and being yeah. like, let's go to Hooters. Like, you know, like the punk rockers dudes were just sitting back being like, it's not that funny. It's like, it's not that good. And like that. I think you're, I think you're trying to not like it. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I think because you are, I think you are actively trying to not like it because of what you associate with it that you associate liking it with those guys. Look, I have to admit, I have to take the place of like, perhaps there's a grain of truth there. Perhaps there is. I can't act like I know myself so well that that's not the truth. But what I can say is this like, I've just like, I quoted it with people. Everyone thought it was funny, but the whole time I was just like, it's just not really my style of humor. It's like that, that, okay. I will say this and then I'll be done. Cyprian, that, netflix made by bots the like the yes. romance one dude that's like that's my humor and like that's just just like just like i don't know what it is people have called it anti-comedy and i don't i don't like that i'm not really into that type of thing but like tim heidecker from tim and eric awesome show yes. like that's my dude and then um people who follow into that vein of just like interesting the most ridiculous, the most like absolute, and like not being loud and squinting and yelling something doesn't make you funny. And that's kind of what I think Will for, uh, Will Ferrell does. I mean, I don't know. For sure. No, that is, yeah, I do think that's, I do think that's his humor. I don't know. That, I no, find it hilarious. Yeah, like <laughs> the more cowbell sketch, that's brilliant. I mean, that's absolutely. That's, what, that's what comes off what the very first, when you said that and said, well, what's the, the, honestly, that's the first sketch that pops into my mind of like, perhaps the greatest of all, but it's because Christopher Walken's it's Christopher in. Walken. It's it's like- Christopher Walken is the in. one selling that. He just pops in and he just says, and then just goes back out then comes back in. And it's like, he's like not interacting with the argument. He's just continuing to hype up the cow yes. That's what makes yes. that skit brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's not even well. Yes. Again, another thing that he's not necessarily funny in He's just loud and everyone else around him is being pretty funny. Like, but it does it, but it does. There's something about, I'll tell you what it is about Will Ferrell. I'll tell you what it is about Will Ferrell. Please, please. It is. So like, like take that sketch, right? You take that sketch and what is funny about Will Ferrell in that sketch? Really? The, the, the thing that is selling about Will Ferrell in that sketch is his gut hanging out yes, yeah. and the, the pants, the outfit that he's wearing. That's true. And it's like, that's a choice. That's a choice being made by somebody. Yeah. It's not about the line. It's not about any of that. He chose like, I'm going to wear this and I'm going to act like this and it's going to be hilarious. And it is. And not everybody would make that choice. And if you go through every single one of his movies, what what he's wearing how he's moving 
the tone of voice that like, yeah, it seems like in what he's saying that it's about the yelling, but it's not. It's the total of everything. And not everybody can do that. Not everybody can be like, I'm going to wear this outfit. I'm going to wear this wig. And you know, those are choices that he made. I'm going to have this facial hair. What's right? that? I'm going to play the like, cowbell like this. He's like, goes into a boardroom or something just wearing like. Exa exactly. Yeah. He's. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The little, the little briefs. And it's yeah. like, uh, dude. I could, I see your argument. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm going to check him out again at some point this week. I'll do a, I'll watch a compilation of stuff. Just and go, go holistic. But I think what you have, the, the key with this is be like, he made every single one of these decisions. Hmm. He made every single one, like all of this is on purpose that's happening here. That context could be important. Like it's that same thing with like classic rock. I just have to get over it because just the punk rock people I was growing up with, like, listen, man, you don't like classic rock. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't like classic rock. So now I'm like, well, is Led Zeppelin actually good? I don't know. I've never really, well, because father, do you got, go ahead. Yeah. Kid? Will Ferrell, Will Ferrell. Yeah. I mean, all I got is Phil Hartman. I don't, that's it. He was great. He was like, he was the best. That's all I got. He was really good. Did That's you watch news got. radio? Huh? Did you watch news radio? Uh-uh. The TV show? Yeah. Uh -uh. Never seen it. It's Wait, got... wasn't, wasn't Rogan on that too? Joe Rogan's on it. Joe Rogan was on it. Andy yeah. Dick. What's Andy the Dick. dude um, from Kids in the Hall? Dave. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was, um, the guy, he was the alcoholic that only liked sugary drinks. So from Kids in the Hall. Uh, Dave, not, oh, why am I? Oh, whatever. Six, it was the show he was on when he died, when he was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was the show he was on, and it's never going to go well. My only part from that show that I really liked was there's was this lady, and she's like, oh, what are you doing this after? She said, oh, I'm going down to this electronic sale. Apparently crazy, or apparently Al just went crazy and just started slashing prices everywhere all over his store. And I got to get down there. I like just her delivery of like that. Oh, um, what's his name from Oh Brother War Art? That was in it too. Um, in King of the Hill, he's in like everything. Uh, Stephen, um, Stephen Fry. No, not Stephen Fry. Um, he played the Cyclops. Wow, this is really interesting content to hear me try and remember. Name. <laughs> but um, he plays like Boom How or he plays like uh, Bill on King of the Hill. Uh, anyway, no, I can't remember his name. Someone will write it in the YouTube comments. But anyway, yes. Um, so that was our Q and A. Um, and so next week, yeah, we'll get back on with the Creed, and I'm actually going to have some research done and everything done by then, so that I'm not just shooting into the dark. We are, um, on, we are on at this point in the creed and was crucified for us also under Pontius Pilate. And so I would like to talk about, yeah. I would like to talk about Pontius Pilate a little bit next week because okay. he's always been a very interesting person to me um, just in the way that he's portrayed, you know, just the, how often people use the phrase, I wash my hands of this, you know, what the connotations of that are, you know, like, what does that actually mean to like wash your hands of something while letting it happen, you know? Mm. Um, there's been a lot of that. That's a very poignant and uh, timely. There's been a lot of that as of late. Yeah. Father, is there much that says, really quick, is there much that says what happened to him after, after like? A little bit. A little bit? There's a little bit. Is it good? Did he end up happy? Yeah, it, we'll, have, we'll do the research. <laughs> we'll put it all, we'll, we'll have it for next week. So. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah. Did he end up happy? Keep the, keep the emails and stuff coming. Um, we're going to try it maybe at the end of next week. I'd like to answer that third question because it's a good mm -hmm. one. What was it, by the way? Uh, it has to do with a Bible study. What does a good Bible study look like? Oh, uh, let me just answer this real quick. Okay, well, then go on and on about Phil Hartman. There's, uh, <laughs> hold on. Okay, all right. We need to so talk about Phil Hartman, but give me one second. I'll read because there's more to the question. Yeah, so, read yeah. the whole question. Um, but this is from Loopy Fist. Um, what does a good Bible study look like for both personal daily readings and for groups for personal? Should I read a little bit of gospels each day? Should I follow the daily readings of the church for group studies? Should the approach be different if the participants don't have any Christian background? Okay. So here's the deal. 
the there's the lectionary there's the daily readings um that the church offers if you read that every day that's a great opportunity to get some daily scripture reading um there's a bible app called katena that you can go and you can find all all kinds of um, patristic um, commentary on that scripture you can start investing in patristic commentary there's a couple good ones um, and kind of read what the father say St. John Chrysostom is one of the great expositors of scripture. So anything he gives you is gold. Uh, blessed fail fact is good. Literally. Um, in regards of Bible study, the best thing to do is to, first of all, um, have someone who is qualified to do it. <laughs> don't just kind of like, don't just find, you know, whoever, someone like, I read the Bible. Hmm. Don't do that. Find someone who's going to be qualified to do it, to teach it. And then if you do find that person they don't know, um, you know, I, I, I am a big fan of Bible studies and I have a certain way that I go about them where I will have a minimum of two uh, patristic sources that will give commentary. I go line by line and then I'll give those two patristic uh, commentaries. And then I'll give my own um, kind of synthesis of those of those uh, commentaries and try to bring it into the context, exegesis and exegesis type of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I I think that's the best way to go about it. But the biggest thing is is that you know, um, reading the scriptures, getting a good um, Bible commentary. There's also a, a book put out by Saint Vladimir's seminary called the bible and the fathers it's a big thick green book um and it gives you the daily readings and then there's a commentary in there um i think we gave that to you too Cyprian. you have that don't you you did i have it and it's excellent it's, yes, excellent. it's excellent i think it's a it's a great investment if anyone wants to get into reading the holy scripture is an absolute must and um, having this commentary is an absolute must next to it um and I don't know if this is the right place. Forgive me, everybody, if I do this. For, but um, I, I have a cat. We have catechism here that we do on Wednesdays. But when that ends, uh, I I am thinking about picking up and doing a Bible study, and it will be on Zoom. So if I do that, I'll definitely offer it to the audience here. If anyone in the Royal Path audience would be interested, uh, because I love doing Bible studies, and I think. Um, we had a we had a conversation about it a couple catechisms ago, and I think I'll bring it back. And so, yeah, if there's interest, if people are interested, you know, maybe write in and let me know. Well, uh, uh, Father, we can definitely put it out to the mailing list, so they should really? they could sign up on the mail. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the mailing list is for. Great. So let's just let's do that. We'll put together the emails, uh, you know, with the schedule and everything, and Zoom links or whatever. I'll, you and I will will work together to put that together. So. If people want people want to get that uh get on the mailing list andrew will tell you how to get on the mailing list royalpath.network easy done um and then it should obviously there should be approached differently for people with no christian background like a bible study correct yeah it needs to be absolutely simple okay it needs to be absolutely absolutely simple um uh and then the last thing i'll say is i forgot but andrew's corner really quick two two things the one of god asked that they destroy the serpents of brass it was kind of a little bit like god like saying this is why we can't have nice things right <laughs> That's and actually then, funny. <laughs> um, the second one is is that saint john chrysostom said that if um and i forget what made me think of this but saint john chrysostom says always stay for the final blessing during liturgy don't ever take communion and take off because if judas had stayed for the final blessing during the eucharist he wouldn't have betrayed christ mm. so yeah yeah wow. chrysostom so all right good. goodbye everyone bye-bye